to stand on. Great. Um, should we have that? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to... You might be disappointed. I'm not going to show you too many pictures. But I have a reason for that. Um, I'm one of the speakers who's actually taking into cognizance the fact that there was a title, there was a label, and I'm trying to somewhat stick to it. But um, I'm actually not meant to be here. Um, I was meant to be in China at this very moment. The Chinese visa. Well, ever since our beautiful Waspia uh, held this show in Tibet in our gallery, the Chinese have refused me visas. Uh, uh, India refuses me visas. In the United States, for quite some time, I was a special alien. Um, well, I've sadly lost that status. I think I've probably lost my antennae or something. But uh, that's another issue. I'm going to go back. Um, 1976. I'm, I've just graduated, I'm about to start off for my, on my PhD, and in between I'm getting some work experience working in a research lab, and I'm building enzyme active sites. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze things, that, that make biological reactions go better, faster, in synchrony. But what's very interesting about these active sites is that it holds segments of molecules together so that the atoms interact uh, and do what they're meant to do. In a sense, it's what uh, any, um, it's what arranged marriages are like when families get people together or dates are like when friends get people together. You know, if you get people in the right situation together doing things, you can stand back, the hormones take care of things afterwards, um, and things pretty much go on. So, uh, you know, I, I mention that because catalysts are very important things in our lives, and there are many types of catalysts that go on. One of them are teachers. Teachers play a very important role, uh, as do mothers. And, you know, th this thing I'm talking about where uh, you know, if, if things aren't quite right. Well, I remember, for instance, and I'm sure it will apply to you. Uh, when we were kids, we had fights, and mum would go, come on, say sorry, shake hands, make up. And you'd sort of go grudgingly, okay. <laughs> you know. Actually, it wasn't such a bad thing, because you wanted to be friends, you wanted to make up, but your pride got in the way. You know, your ego, your pride, all of that made it difficult, and mum intervening was sort of useful. I sort of wonder whether that might be something you could try with Hasina and Khalida, but then, you know, <laughs> that's another story, another lecture altogether. But uh, the reason I bring it up is because all of these people have played very important roles in our lives, particularly teachers. I was not very good at maths, and I can see some of you might share my predicament, uh, but I did have a very good maths teacher. And um, you know, one of the things he did, it wasn't so much that he taught me maths, he taught me to love the process. He taught me to love being analytical, to, to enjoy working out how things happened and the process. And when I did my A-levels, there was this question that came up, which I was horrified by in the beginning. There's a well, um, there's a bucket, it hangs from uh, a rope, there's a handle, and water is poured into this bucket. It, it slacks, takes the slack from the rope, and then it drops, falls onto the water at the bottom, and slowly it sinks. It's a complicated thing. And the question was, devise a mathematical process that describes this physical phenomenon. I thought, come on, what are you talking about? You know, that's complicated. But then I remembered my teacher, and he had told me how to simplify things, how to bring it down to its essentials, and not to be intimidated by those sort of situations. And uh, I tried to think of what were the parameters that could perhaps help me 
analyze this situation. And one thing that I did remember from my physics was conservation of energy, the fact that the total energy was constant. And I was able, using that, to de develop a differential equation that described this complex physical phenomenon. I thought, wow, I did that. And that's what catalysts do. Catalysts are not things that change themselves, are not things that benefit from the process, but are things that facilitate how things happen. And catalysts in my life have been teachers, have been my mum, but have also been children. And I will take this time, I'm only going to show you two pictures, I'm going to take this time to talk about three children who had a very, very big impact on my life. One of them was a little girl called Karina, a four-year-old Irish, blonde hair, little turned up, cute nose, came to visit with her mum and dad to our little flat in Lalmatia. And I remember it was a little bit like this. How many of you saw the moon last night? Yes, wasn't it beautiful? Yeah. So this was a moonlit night. And Karina was on that veranda in a little white dress, dancing in the moonlight. And I, it was magical. I remember it. Uh, later, about a year later, I, I had a show in Belfast. And her parents, Paddy and Deborah, had a little flat in a small town called Newry, very close to um, Belfast. And I'd go out during the day. One day I'm coming back. And they did have a big house. And Karina's, Karina was moved to mum and dad's room so Uncle Shahidul could have a room for himself. Um, so I'm back um, in at the end of the day and I'm emptying my pockets. I put some coins on the table. And Karina's at the doorway. Usually when she sees me, she runs up to me, jumps onto my lap. Uh, you know, we hug and we kiss and we tell each other stories. But on that day, she's standing there at the doorway, quizzical. I say, what's the matter, Karina? She looks at me and goes, you've got money. I said, yes, I've got money. But, but you're from Bangladesh. Now, she couldn't make it fit. This five-year-old girl suddenly cannot make that equation work. And that got me thinking, you know, what sort of an educational, cultural environment does a five-year-old girl in Belfast or wherever grow up in where she is incapable of seeing this beautiful country that I live in, this wonderful space, the culture, the heritage that I've known as my own, but yet only recognize me as an icon of poverty. And that got me thinking, and that was precisely why I took on photography, because I recognized what a powerful tool it was, the fact that here was a tool that was largely being used by white Western photographers to create an identity for me that I did not identify with. Uh, so that became the basis of the agency that I, that I run and an opportunity to tell, tell stories. But then I began to ask myself questions about my own position. I am a middle-class male photographer. And in many situations when I'm taking a picture, perhaps of a poor woman in a slum, the power relationship isn't actually very different from what she would have with a white Western photographer. I have the camera, I have the control, I decide what story is told, she has zero say in the process. But I will, so while I'm doing that, I thought, okay, I need to challenge my own position in this process then. And we started teaching women photography, and then we started teaching working class children photography, and that'll take you to the first of my two pictures, hopefully. Ah, oh, okay, be there. That in the middle is Iqbal with a cap. On the left is Zakir, on the right is Palan. There were 11 of them, all really naughty. Um, six girls, five boys, and I was going to work with them for six weeks. Basically, I got adopted, um, so the process didn't end. But you know, I started teaching them photography. They would come to the agency. At one stage, the kids come up to me and say, we want bicycles. Uh, you did have someone earlier talking about bicycles. I've been riding bicycles for 45 years in this city. Um, I knew kids like bicycles. But they had a rationale. They weren't just going to ask for bicycles. They said, look, you know, you spend so much money every day for us to come to the agency. They'd done a cost-benefit analysis and said, if you give us bicycles over so much time, you will actually be saving money. Great. Yeah. 
But I had a problem. You know, I know the streets of Dhaka, and I didn't really want their parents coming at me uh, because I'd given them bicycles. So we decided on two things. First, it was going to cost about 30,000 taka or so. I would pay the first 500. Uh, they would pay the first 500. It would be their bike. But I had another condition. You need to get permission from your mum and dad before I give you bicycles. One of the things we talked about before was how we could replicate this. It was a fantastic experience for them, for me. The kids were going to school, they were learning, they were doing fun things, they were enjoying themselves. They wanted to replicate it. They wanted other kids to enjoy it. And, you know, we are not a Grameen or a Brack. We don't do things in thousands. We're a tiny organization. So we thought, okay, what can we do? The kids would teach their parents to read and write. That was the first thing we tried to do, which was quite interesting in several ways. I mean, reverse the roles, give them a greater role in their own communities, and was something very functional. So two days later, Iqbal, in the middle, comes with a torn piece of paper, torn out from his handbook, uh, and in scrawly writing, his mum has written, yes, Iqbal can have his bicycle. You have my permission. This was the first letter she had ever written, and Iqbal had taught her to write that letter. And the family took that piece of paper, framed it. It was the proudest possession of the family, and it was up on, they don't have a mantelpiece, but it was in a very prominent place. They all looked at it. And that got me thinking, you know, when we evaluate things, we try and work out the value of things, there are certain things we don't actually always appreciate. And certainly no accountant who would, in my office, be if I gave someone to do an audit, they would calculate values of computers, furniture, bank balance, until we are in a position where we can actually recognize the value of something like that letter in transforming people's lives. We've not really learned to appreciate things. And I think that is, for me, what, I'm, uh, th what the crux of the matter is, which is also what takes us to the title of this presentation. When I first went to Iran, I found something very interesting. If you told someone you were beautiful, they would say, your eyes are beautiful. And I found that a lovely expression because at the end of the day, that really is what beauty is about. About There's beauty in everything. And it's whether you can appreciate it, you recognize it, and you give people the sense that they are valued. And that, for me, uh, was a very important thing. And I'll move on, we have little time. Um, while that happened, I started looking also at other situations. There is the converse of it, of what we do not value, of things that are wrong, of things that should be righted but we do not. Often we, as has happened here, we've seen terrible wrongs that brave people have tried to right. What we often forget are the wrongs we ourselves are involved in some way. And uh, let's hope this one works, does it? Next picture, okay. Try again. Okay, that's Mizan. He worked at my mother's house. As happened, Kajil look, you know, young kid, child labor, but I won't go into that one now. Mizan used to go inside that room where we used to watch television. We called it the drawing room. There's a TV, we sit and watch. But Mizan doesn't sit inside that room to watch television. He cleans everything, then he sits just outside the room through the open doorway he watches TV. He used to love a program called Alif Laila. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Mizan's there watching TV every day. And my parents are very emancipated people, broad-minded, educationists, you know, important people in society. Yet this happens every day in our own house. So I take this picture. I publish it in our calendar. I give one copy to Mizan, one copy to my mother. The next day, Mizan sits inside that room to watch television. Very tiny little difference. Right? But a very significant one. Because, you know, when we think of the great things that we do, we often forget the small little things we need to do. The fact that effortlessly, when we talk to someone in a suit, we say, Apni, when it's the rickshaw, it becomes to me. Uh, when there are issues of class, there are all sorts of digressions that take place. And I'm not going to go into that too much, but I do want to leave you with the idea 
of what beauty to me is. It is about being able to unravel things and find the nuggets that are around us everywhere. It is about recognizing things that are not right within us and questioning it constantly. And I would like to leave you with an act that I'd like you to do. Um, turn around to someone near you, someone you do not recognize, say hello, smile, make friends. It could be a life-transforming experience for both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.